Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're beginning this evening's board meeting with the uh, Truth and Taxation public hearing. I call this hearing to order and ask the clerk to please call the roll. Trustee Daney? Here. Gansey? Here. Here. Hopkins? Here. Here. Wonski? Here. President Wallace? Here. I will turn it over to Village Administrator Ms. Schumacher. This public hearing is for input on the 2023 Village of Bartlett property tax levy. For truth and taxation purposes, we are required to hold a public hearing because our increase to the prior year's extension is more than 5%. In total, the levy is $1,071,272 or 9.08% more than the 2022 estimated extension. We discussed the 2023 tax levy at the last two Committee of the Whole meetings. The village levies property tax to fund operating expenditures in the general fund, to pay for principal and interest on general obligation bonds, and to fund the village's contribution to the police pension fund. The purpose of the property tax levy, or, I'm sorry, the proposed property tax levy totals $12,874,801. The 2023 tax rates for Cook, DuPage, and Kane counties will be determined in the spring of 2024 when the counties finalize the EAV for the 2023 tax levy. Typically, the village accounts for 10% of a resident's total property tax bill. This levy will be presented to the village board on December 5th for the final approval, and the levy will be filed with each county clerk no later than December 26th 2023. Thank you, Madam Administrator. With that being said, does anyone have any comments and any public comments? We'll open it up to that for the hearing here. Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn the hearing. So moved. Second. Moved by Trustee Daney, seconded by Trustee Gunstein. Will the clerk please call the roll? Trustee Gansey? Yes. Bernstein? Yes. Hopkins? Laporte? Yes. Zawanski? Yes. Dane? Yes. Hearing is adjourned. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Village of Bartlett board meeting for November 7, 2023. I call the meeting to order and ask the clerk to again please call the roll. Trustee Daney? Here. Gansey? Here. Gunstein? Here. Hopkins? Here. Laporte? Here. Zawanski? Here. President Wallace? Here. We have requested Pastor Alex Goff of Papa Creek Church do our invocation this evening. Pastor Goff, thanks for being here. Let's pray. God, as the holidays are fast upon us, uh, we pray that this community would continue to be the light that it is, that over the next few months, as the hungry uh, come to us, we would continue to feed them. As the lonely come to us, we would continue to find them places uh, of home. As the strangers come to us, we pray that they, we pray that they would feel welcomed. God, uh, continue to equip this community to be the shining light that it is. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Brings us to our consent agenda this evening. All items listed with an asterisk will be enacted in one motion. There will be no separate discussion on items on the, agenda, on the consent agenda. That being said, would anybody like to add or remove anything from the consent? Uh, Mr. President, I'd like to add uh, item F1, that's the purchase of the 2024 Ford is there any discussion around the purchase of the new Super Duty truck? Anybody like to leave that on the agenda? No, but it came in under budget, so thank you. <laughs> Budgeted for our yeah. previous budget. Right. All right, so we will asterisk that. Anything else? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to amend the consent agenda that will include the board minutes, uh, board minutes from October 17, 2023, the committee minutes from October 3, um, and October 17, 2023. The consent this evening will also include the bills list uh, from November 7, 2023. The consent this evening will also include understanding committee reports items A1, item C2, item D1, and we'll be adding item F1. So moved. Second. Moved by Trustee Daney, seconded by Trustee Gansey. The clerk, please call the roll. Trustee Gunstein? 
Yes. Hopkins? Yes. Laporte? Yes. Sawanski? Yes. Daney? Yes. Gansey? Yes. That motion carries. Now entertain a motion to approve the amended consent. So moved. Second. Moved by Trustee Daney, second by Trustee Sawanski. Will the clerk please call the roll? Trustee Hopkins? Yes. Laporte? Yes. Sawanski? Yes. Daney? Yes. Gansey? Yes. Gunstein? Yes. That motion carries. Moves us down to our uh, president's report this evening. We have two items on the president's report. The first is of, of which is to reappoint um, for three-year terms the board and police board of police and fire commissioners. So, with that, um, with the advice and consent of the, uh, I'll entertain a motion to concur to the reappointment of Dr. Jane Kirkby to serve a three-year term on the Board of Police and Fire Commissioners beginning November 7, 2023, expiring November 7, 2026. So moved. Second. Good by Trustee Daney. <coughs> Second by Trustee Laporte. Will the clerk please call the roll? Trustee Laporte? Yes. Suwanski? Yes. Daney? Yes. Gansey? Yes. Bernstein? Yes. Hopkins? Yes. That motion carries. The next one I'd like to reappoint, um, a motion to concur the reappointment of John McGuire to serve a three-year term on the Board of Police and Fire Commissioners beginning November 7, 2023, expiring November 7, 2026. So moved. Second. Moved by Trustee Daney, second by Trustee Gunstein. Will the clerk please <clears throat> call the roll? Trustee Swanski? Yes. Daney? Yes. Gansey? Yes. Gunstein? Yes. Hopkins? Yes. Laporte? Yes. That motion carries. And finally, um, but certainly not least, uh, can, I would request a motion to concur to the reappointment of John Sampy to serve a three-year term on the police of, uh, Board of Police and Fire Commissioners beginning November 7, 2023 and ending November 6, 2026. So moved. Second. Moved by Trustee Suwanski, second by Trustee Daney. Will the clerk please call the roll? Trustee Daney? Yes. Gansey? Yes. Gunstein? Yes. Hopkins? Yes. Laporte? Yes. Suwanski? Yes. Motion carries. Next item we have is an auditor's report. So everybody buckle down. I'm assuming, Mr. Treasurer, are you ready for that? Yes, yes thank you. Uh, yeah, Jamie guest. Wilkie is from Ladabach and Eamon, and uh, they've been here, she's been here before. Uh, so I'll turn it over to Jamie. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for having us again this year to present the annual financial report. Uh, this is for fiscal year ended April 30th, 2023. I want to certainly start this evening by thanking the finance team. I know there's several of them in attendance this evening. Uh, they really do an outstanding job preparing for the audit. They are always well prepared, ready for us when we come in. Uh, full disclosure of everything that we need to review and document. So I certainly want to take the opportunity this evening to thank uh, Todd and Matt and uh, Millie and the entire rest of the department. So thank you all very much for your hard work. Uh, we do have a few items to cover this evening. I think I've added about 200 pages to your board packet, unfortunately. So I'll try to break that down this evening. Uh, on the screen tonight, you'll find the first formal letter that we are required to issue to the board each year as part of the audit process. This letter is what we call our SAS 114 letter. It covers really standard disclosures that have to go to any governance board. Uh, this is where we would have to communicate things like adjusting journal entries that weren't agreed to, uh, disagreements with management, any issues that we might have with things like audit estimates. Uh, what you'll find in the letter that we have issued is really disclosure of none of those items. So really standard language entitled, or sorry, outlining that everything really went according to kind of the audit plan that we were expecting. So no issues to report this evening. Uh, the second formal letter that is issued is what we call our management letter. This is our opportunity each year to provide things like best practice recommendations as well as governmental accounting standards board or GASB compliance changes that we have coming down the pipeline. Uh, you'll see this year we actually have four new pronouncements to contend with. Uh, in the coming years, so we will be working with the finance team to appropriately implement each of those standards. 
Uh, in total, those probably cover about a thousand pages of technical uh, language, so we certainly won't go through that in detail tonight. Uh, but do know that GASB has been very active with new standards. These are not simple standards right now, so there is a lot of effort being put in uh, by the finance team uh, over the last couple of years and continuing going forward. As part of the management letter, you'll also find uh, several pages towards the back that provide updates to prior year recommendations. Again, I won't go through those in detail this evening, but we have provided updates to prior uh, pronouncements as well as prior comments as well. Uh, and then lastly, the largest document, which covers almost 200 pages, is our annual comprehensive financial report. Uh, so that then covers really the annual audit, required statements and note disclosures, as well as some other sections that are required as part of the state filing each year. Uh, so my goal this evening will be to cover some of the key areas that our boards are typically interested in. Uh, first off, we'll hit page 8, which covers the village's Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting. Uh, this is another independent review of the village's annual audit. It is conducted by the Government Finance Officers Association. Uh, this award program is really deemed the highest level financial reporting that any local government can undertake each year. So there is about an inch and a half thick checklist that we do review each year to make sure the village's audit is in compliance with that program, and we're happy to report that the village did in fact earn that award for last year's audit, which is included as page eight. We will again be submitting this year's audit to the award program, obviously anticipating receipt of it again for the current fiscal year. Immediately after this section on pages 11 through 13 of the document, you'll find the independent auditor's report. As I stated, state statute does require each local government to undertake an independent audit within six months of the close of the fiscal year. What you will find within these few pages is really the actual opinions as well as discussion on internal controls. So number one, from an opinion perspective, we have issued what we call an unmodified or clean audit opinion. That is the highest level opinion that the village can earn each year. What that indicates in the language there is that the financial statements as presented are materially correct. And that's the opinion you want your auditor to be able to issue each year. As I said, you'll find quite a bit of discussion around internal controls. So as part of the audit each year, we are required to take a look at the overall internal control environment for the village. While we're not providing an opinion on internal controls, we're opining on the financial statements, uh, we are required to do detailed testing of controls. Certainly, if there were any areas of concern or red flags or findings, you would have seen those outlined in the two formal letters. So again, we're happy to report no such findings related to internal controls. After the independent auditors section of the document, you'll find a section labeled Management's Discussion and Analysis, or MDNA. Uh, these 13 pages of the document really do serve as the executive summary. I said you have almost 200 pages that has been growing each year, unfortunately, with these new compliance requirements. Uh, so this section really is focused on providing that executive summary. What were the key uh, results for the year? How did those compare to prior fiscal year? What were major capital asset investments as well as long-term debt activity throughout the fiscal year? I always encourage our boards, if you read nothing else in detail in those nearly 200 pages, this is the section to read in detail. Uh, you will see overall it was a positive year for the village. Equity in total was up. Uh, there are still some strong revenue trends happening with things like state shared revenue and investment earnings uh, and really continued investment in capital assets, which creates obviously an asset on the books for the village. So overall, I just wanted to point out it was a good financial performance here. Flipping then to page 100 of the audit document, I do want to provide just a brief budget to actual comparison schedule 
for the village's general fund, which is obviously the major operating fund of the village. Uh, this is where you'll see some of that trend information related to revenues in particular. It was a strong performance year within the general fund. There was a surplus of about $2.2 million. Uh, you'll see much of that is coming from revenues that came in higher than anticipated. We are seeing that across almost every municipal client we work with and some cost controlling on the expenditure side as well. So overall about a $2.2 million surplus for the year. Very last section, I promise, we are going to head to page 154, which starts what we call our statistical section of the report. Uh, this is one of the required sections for the certificate award that the village receives. I pointed out this evening because there is really a wealth of historical information provided at the back of the report. I think most folks don't quite get there as they go through the document. Uh, but certainly from a board member perspective, you will find 10-year trend information for financial results, long-term debt history, property tax history, uh, capital asset history, operating indicators, number of full-time employees, uh, really a wealth of information at the back of the report that I always like to point out as well. Uh, but overall, I just want to reiterate the positive audit uh, this year, clean opinion, no internal control findings, and certainly I'll hand it over to the board for any questions then at this point. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions regarding the audit review? I would have more questions if it was bad. Right. <laughs> yeah. Do we rank pretty high? Um, you know, against other claims in other municipalities. It seems like this is pretty clean. This is very clean. So a couple of things. Um, I can tell you when we come in to conduct the village's audit here, it is very well organized. We really typically have very few adjustments to work through with the team. Um, I would say for a community of this size, that's probably not the norm. We normally walk in and expect to probably have much more work to get to an end product such as this, this evening. Um, so yes, we kind of typically, you guys are definitely in the upper category of prepared, knowledgeable clients that we work with in the municipal space. Do you know how, what, what percentage of communities get that certificate? Oh, gosh. Um, so it's a national award, I can tell you that. I will tell you it's hard for me to judge because we work with a lot of certificate clients. We're actually one of the top 10 firms in the country. So we have a lot of clients who work with our firm for that purpose, if that makes sense, to obtain the award. Um, I would say in the municipal space, maybe around 50% of the clients we work with go for that award program. So. Is there anything else? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me this evening. That does it for the President's report this evening. Does anybody have any questions for staff? I have a couple of, uh, a couple of uh, items I'd like to talk about the anniversaries and the birthdays for November of staff. We have our Chief of Police, Jeff Ricalis. His uh, anniversary is 27 years the uh, Village of Bartlett. Congratulations. He's not here today. I know it. Yeah. He's out celebrating his birthday. Let's <laughs> hope so he doesn't get a DUI. <laughs> his anniversary, I'm sorry, his anniversary. <laughs> celebrating that. Birthdays are next. We have uh, jo Joey uh, Denenberg. He's our management an analyst. His birthday is the fo fourth, right? And we have Chris Hostetler. He's our IT coordinator. His birthday is the 13th of November. Tony Fraden, our uh, economic development coordinator. His birthday is the 18th of this month. And then lastly, we have Sam Hughes, our senior management analyst. His birthday is on the 20th. So I like congratulations, guys. I like to add that tomorrow's Kurt's birthday. Tomorrow's <laughs> Kurt's birthday, the village attorney, yay. Oh, it's Kurt's birthday tomorrow? Yeah. Well, congratulations. Thank you. I didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? That's all I have. I got one thing. Um, 
I noticed over the last <laughs> several months, we've, uh, Ryan Mraz has been on our road list. And some of them, I, I know I talked to our finance director about it, and some of the bills are like nine months old. Um, I'd like to have a policy that's 90 days old or invoiced over 90 days. We don't pre-issue a check. The board actually gets an explanation why it's 90 days old and a detailed bill of that. I just uh, I don't understand how we can have bills that are 9, 10, 11 months past and then anyway. I don't know what I had for dinner last week, let alone what someone's billing, you know, and this is hundreds of thousands of dollars. This isn't like a small change here. So it's, I just want to make sure that the board understands what is he billing for and why is it nine months old. Um, we do get that um, detailed breakdown and we'll include it with the bills list. Thank you. Anything else? How would you find that out? That's uh, it, it's in the bills list, and he hasn't worked for the village for a while. Yeah, that's the main thing. His secretary is out, and he's be way behind on that. Um, anything else? All right, then we will move on to the town hall portion of the meeting. If anyone would like to address the board at this time, kindly step up to the podium and state your name and address for the record, and try to keep your comments to three minutes. Anyone in the chamber like to address the board at this time? Who do we got on there, Chris? John, anybody online like to address the board? We do not. All right, moving on to standing uh, committee reports. First standing committee report, building and zoning committee, Chairman Gunstein. Thank you, President Walsh. Uh, we had item one that was covered under consent. Thank you, Chairman Gunstein. Community and Economic Development Committee, Chairman Gansey. Thank you, Mr. President. We have nothing to report tonight. Chairman Gansey, Finance Committee, Chairman Laporte. Oh, I've got something here. Let me pull it up. Uh, I have an agenda item, uh, 2023 estimated property tax levy. Uh, the budget amount is $12,874,801. The village board discussed the proposed tax levy at the October 3rd and the October 17th committee meetings. Uh, the next step is to establish the estimated 2023 property tax levy. An estimated levy must be established at least 20 days prior to the adoption of the final levy, which is scheduled for December 5th, 2023. The estimated property tax levy for 2023 totals uh, 12,874,801, a 9.08% increase from the 2022 estimated extension. The general corporate tax levy increase of $750,000 is expected to be offset by the addition of taxable assessed value being added due to the closing of the Brewster Creek TIF. Uh, the police pension levy of $2,682,060 is an increase of $478,439 over the 2022 police pension levy. Pension cost increases were related to two service retirements salary increases, and a reduction of the assumed rate of return by 0.125%. The increased contribution requirement from the prior year of $319,175 will again be funded from the general fund. The debt service levy is higher than the prior year levy by $26,826. Overall, the levy increased Increase not supported by added taxable property from the Brewster Creek TIF closing is 4.35% or approximately $40 to $45 uh, for a home with a market value of about $400,000. Uh, we're here tonight to do a motion. Do uh, we have any discussion? And Todd, if you want to summarize anything. I have a motion and a second, and then we can discuss. Motion. All right, so the motion is to move that, I move that the estimated 2023 property tax levy be established at $12,874,801. Is You need a second on there, right? Yep. I'll second that. Moved by Trustee Laporte, seconded by Trustee Daney. Is there any discussion? I do have some discussion regarding it. I mean, 
we don't take lightly increasing taxes. I'm a resident of Bartlett. We're all residents of Bartlett here. So um, something that I've discussed with staff and a few of the board members, we've already approved a budget that this levy is for. Um, and projects are already underway under the capital budget for here, for this portion. But I expressed it to the staff that I'm going to be taking a vigorous examination of our 2024 budget to see where we can save to reduce this back down in, in 2024. Sounds good. You know, we have 300 homes going on the tax rolls at D.H. Horton. We have a car dealer coming in. We have Aldi's coming in. We have other sources of income coming in next year. So we should see something to offset this. And, and hopefully um, we can go through the capital expenses and maybe, you know, push those out a couple of years instead of doing them all in one year. So, uh, but as far as raising, you know, raising taxes, it, it never sits easy with me. So. And we have maintained for a number of years pretty flat level, so minor increase, if anything. So this is the first year that it's spiked in a while. How many years was it flat, Paul? Uh, from about 2008 uh, going forward, a couple of years ago, we raised it as we uh, raised it about 100,000 for the brush pickup program. But it's been pretty pretty flat since the 2008 2009 year. That's the general corporate levy, police pension. We've been increasing our levy. We increased the debt service levy for um, I know when we did the police station bonds and that, but that's been pretty level in the last few years as well. Police pension levy is the, the bulk of what we're de dealing with. Yeah, including this levy, it's <clears throat> pension levy. Uh, general fund has been supported by the increase in businesses, uh, sales tax, and so. I, go ahead. Go ahead. There you go. Good. So I know we received information from the village on some, some things that we can expect in the future. Can I reiterate some with the houses going in and other projects that were going on, like how that will impact us in the future? We do have, um, as uh, Trustee um, Gunstein noted, we have a number of um, things that are coming online, right? Um, we don't um, include revenues until we, you know, really see them coming in. So we make very um, conservative estimates on those revenues for um, um, especially those that we have um, tax rebate agreements with. Um, we, that is the car dealership, um, more, um, all the, um, when those start to come online, once they're in there for a year, we have a better way to estimate them. So we do estimate those very conservatively. Uh, we have grasslands that will be um, coming with, um, I think, Christy, you told me today that they have um, plans to have uh, more um, units available that, that they will completely build out um, in the next year. So we're going, you know, they're moving fast. Um, the car dealership uh, has indicated that they would like to be selling cars by Black Friday. So um, that is ahead of schedule. Um, so we have these pretty significant um, revenue generators coming online, but we we have estimated those revenues um, cautiously. We don't want to overstate them, but they will be coming um, in the next year, next year and a half. The other um, thing to consider is that some of those rebate agreements that we have will be expiring. They'll be coming off. Um, that those 50-50 that we um, have, um, a number of those will be expiring in the next one to two years. So as some of these uh, developments like come online, at what point will we know like what the impact is and like looking at the budget so we don't get in a position like when it's levy time that it's increasing? Yeah, 
yeah, in the case of the of the car dealership, now that that money is fifty percent is being rebated and fifty percent is going towards the the debt that was um, built up in the Lake Lake Street TIF where the parking lot is. So that's going to go pay off that property. So we won't actually see any sales tax revenue to the general fund from the car dealership until after that two and a half million in the um, in the debt is paid off. So that will be a, a few years. Uh, as far as all the few, few. As far as the new homes, the way that we would recognize or receive the revenue from the new homes is, would be by increasing, actually increasing the levy. So. Um, that the whole the revenue you get from uh, residential property is from property taxes so we would kind of like when the TIF rolled in to the uh, onto our regular tax rolls we had to increase the levy to uh, recognize that revenue so sometimes we raise the levy it doesn't increase increase the taxes for everybody so that that's another uh, thing to realize um, but normally we we see the a new business comes in. We see what kind of taxes came in, and then we budget for it the next year. That's that's how we that's how we uh, do the sales tax. Uh. Is, there, is there an impact on this to the property tax increase to small businesses? I don't recall seeing that in any of our examples. Small businesses. I want to say that. They're all different values, so I think um, they would have to. You would have to base that on if their assessed value is four hundred thousand. Now in Cook County, they assess the values different than DuPage County as far as the percent of the tax that they. Or any of the businesses out in Brewster Creek, the larger ones. Right, we we it would be the same. The rate in DuPage County. It would be about a 4% increase to their taxes. So when we, when you were taking into account the shortfall that we have, the examples we saw were on homeowners? Yeah. So that would affect a homeowner? Just about 95% of our taxable assessed value is, is residential. Mm -hmm. So they're the, they're the bulk of the, of the uh, that are going to pay the tax. But the increase for the businesses was included in those totals. Yeah, the the increase that we're talking about is across the board. We we use examples of residential properties uh, because again, that's ninety five percent of of what makes up our taxable uh, base. So, what ideas do we have, or options do we have, or can we brainstorm on this, knowing that our police pension is going to double again within, I believe, a year or two ago you said it was going to double again, so we're maybe in eight more years we'll be doubling, which isn't necessarily sustainable. Yeah, so I, what options? I don't remember saying that the pension was going to pension. It did double, right? It has doubled. Over and I think a year or two ago I asked you if we could anticipate it doubling again, and you said yes at the time. And I understand those are things that are not in your control, okay, but we're not the only municipality dealing with this, so are there, are there other options or opportunities on the table to address that? Because these are policies that are being set in Springfield. Yeah. Um, let, in Springfield. Yeah, let me take the um, Springfield part first. Um, there is legislation under consideration um, both in the um, veto and moving forward to do two things. One is to increase the Tier 2 benefits, which will increase our costs. Um, the other um, flip side of that coin is the um, extension of when we would need to be fully funded. Right now it's 2040. They're um, talking about um, extending that to be um, another, you know, I think they're talking now 2050. Yeah, so that will give us, that will take some of the pressure off for that fund, for reaching that funding goal. 
Um, there are um, um, some things like you mentioned outside of our, our control, the um, rate of return on the investments of the fund, um, the number of retirees. Um, if you will recall, um, when we talked about our hiring needs and our the, the um, turnover within the department, we hired a number of police officers through the COPS grant in the 90s when we were growing, and they have all kind of hit that sweet spot of when to retire. Um, we do not um, anticipate having that wave of retirements coming up. So that is another thing that will help hold down those pension costs. We have a policy of um, funding 100% of the actuarial recommendations. Um, not every community follows that philosophy. Um, I would, however, not recommend backing off of that. But that is an option that um, you can consider. Since, since we have determined that a lot of our shortfall has to do with policies driven in Springfield and um, our lack of proper funding for the LGDF, I would like to see some public awareness from perhaps the mayor, or the mayor, the mayor is a, is a community, is a coalition, like we did with the railroads, mm -hmm. to get public, the public involved in this and have them understand that Springfield is holding our money, holding their money. This is my money. I'm a resident. You're a resident. Everybody here is a resident. And when we have to raise our taxes, because they owe us, because they're giving things away somewhere else, that's not acceptable. One of the I would just suggest we have had a big push a couple of years ago when it was coming up in legislation with the uh, DuPage mayors and managers. I was very active in that. We were all very active in that. Um, we had um, one of the things I have, have uh, Todd do when he's doing his, uh, his reviews is explain where we're short, how much we're short for that purpose so we can get it on public record. But I totally agree with you. We need to make sure that we're putting more and more pressure. We can't let Metro mayors or DuPage mayors and managers just let this slide anymore. I mean, they, they don't let it slide, but we got to keep pushing, pushing, pushing for that money. And, and that is one of the uh, messages that the, the COGS have given us is that we have made some incremental um, progress, little as it is, um, in Springfield to get LDGF um, back up to where um, it has um, historically been. Where, where, yeah, where it had been um, degraded. Um, the conferences um, have committed to keeping that part of their legislative agenda in Springfield with our with the COG lobbyists. One of the um, things that the mayors are very involved in and the managers as well are the individual meetings with our legislators. And we have a one sheet um, for each community that um, tallies up the, the difference in that funding that the mayor has alluded to, but also programs that um, and projects that are not being done because, of, because there's no money to do them. Um, we also have um, a little history lesson for those legislators who hadn't been part of the grand bargain to reduce it and restore it. Um, and those have been very effective for um, lobbying our legislators. The um, conferences are in the process of updating those and we will be updating those. Um, we can include those um, out to the community. Um, one of the things that this board has done in the past is passed a, a resolution calling for the um, legislator to restore LDGF funding, and we can certainly do that again to shine a spotlight on it. And just to reiterate that, um, I was sitting at a meeting with the DuPage mayors and managers when we were discussing what is the highest, most impact you can have, and everybody was just saying, well, just show them the number. 
and I actually brought up the fact that you need to show them the programs we're missing. You need to show them the, the things that we're missing because you guys have taken this money away. So that was part of one of the things I did when I was on the board at DuPage Mayors and Managers. But that's something that's really important because all the residents then can see it in black and white. And to your point, I believe you said this at the last meeting, they don't care, <clears throat> but the residents will care because they don't know. If you go home and talk to people in your household, they probably don't know. And your neighbors across the street don't know, and the neighbors next door to you don't know. But if they start seeing articles in the Herald or the Examiner or the Tribune, they might figure it out then. Yeah, and then this is when people wake up, is when their real estate taxes go up. They say, well, why did the village raise our real estate taxes? And we can point to that exact reason. That's an exact fact for the numbers. If we had if we had if we had the funding properly we would not be having this conversation. No. Correct? If we had the funding we would have zero raised in the levy, is that correct? Yeah. What year did they cut the LGDF? Two thousand they started playing with it. They went down to they went down to eight eight and then six. Right. And they did it the year they raised it from three the state tax from three to five. So what year was that? I don't remember uh, what year it was, but when they raised the state tax from three uh, percent to five percent, they just took the state took all the increase and kept, and that's where ours went. <coughs> when it went down, did we raise taxes to offset that? We did not. We did not. At all. Yeah. That's one of the reasons why. Did we raise? Did we? Prior to that, did we raise it for the police pension instead of taking it out of the general fund? The police pension has been supported by the property tax levy. Yeah, it's a tricky situation. But Springfield has announced, what, $15 million to promote tourism in the state? Grants? We can promote our tourism with our money if we want to. They owe us money, but they're giving money away. Anything else, Chairman? That's it. I think people also should realize, and I got my tax bill from Cook County, um, the village only gets 9% of that, a little over 9% of the entire tax bill. 62% of our tax bill goes to the U46 school district, um, of which, you know, there's a big portion of it. And uh, it's just 21% from Cook County was a, uh, it was a little bit of a shock. You know, $40 is a lot of money to some people. It might not be a lot to other people, but again, you know, it's, it's unfortunate, but we have to, well, U46 just approved a $48.8 million budget. We're trying to propose a $12.9 million budget. Right. And they did it, and nobody said a word. Yep. It just happens, and we just have to take it. Cook County raised it 21% without saying a word. And the Village of Bartlett portion of the tax bill is 10%. U46 is 63 Combined with uh, Elgin Community College, which is like 1% or 2% or something like that. So. We could run four villages of Bartlett for the price of U46. Maybe five. <laughs> well, I'm just looking at the $48 million increase. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, there's another way to look at this as well. Um, you can't have the inflation the way it was without it costing the village more to run the village. That's pretty much common sense. So, neighbors up. Well, in the, yeah, and the inflation rate is, they're saying it's what, 4%? It's really closer to 11 currently. Right. It took a lot of things out of the calculation to come up with the inflation to make them look better. Anyway. I think we have a motion in a second. Does anybody have any other discussion? Please call the roll. Trustee Ganzi? Yes. Dunstein? Yes. Hopkins? No. Laporte? Yes. 
Swanski? Yes. Ganey? Regretfully, yes. A motion carries. Where were we at? Thank you, Chairman Laporte. Um, your other item is on consent. A license and ordinance committee, Chairman Hopkins. Thank you, President Wallace. We have one item on the agenda, and it was covered under the consent. Thank you, Chairman Hopkins. Police and Health Committee, Chairman Swanski. Thank you, Mr. President. We have nothing to report this evening. Chairman Swanski, Public Works and Golf Committee, Chairman Daney. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, we covered that on consent. F1. Thank you, Chairman Daney. Any new business that anyone would like to discuss other than Marion Bright? When is, I just, a quick question I forgot to ask. When does fall leaf cleanup go through? Question. When does fall leaf cleanup? Do we think we might have to extend that like we did the one year through? Okay, thanks. I have a comment. I just want to uh, just want to thank Bartlett Hills for uh, I had an event at Bartlett Hills. Uh, everybody spoke highly. Evan did a great job. Staff did a great job. Uh, it exceeded people's expectations. I just want to say thank you to Bartlett Hills for that. That was awesome. And we were able to raise uh, $600 for uh, brain cancer. That's fantastic. I know the new business uh, for me is, I think I commented the last time on how early the Marion Bright is this year, and I have a wedding the same night. So I am not going to be at the Marion Bright. Oh. I've got a wedding. But uh, I'm sure you guys will represent well. <laughs> Any other new business? Any questions for staff? I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. By Trustee Danny, second by Trustee Laporte. Will the clerk please call the roll? Trustee Gunstein? Yes. Hopkins? Yes. Laporte? Yes. Sawanski? Yes. Danny? Yes. Gansey? Yes. We are adjourned.